I remember when I was a teenager, maybe you do too, did any of you get excited just to find out what the text was going to be, what your preacher was preaching from? I remember as a teenager, because like George, I really took great notes as a teenager. I still, well, I had those notebooks for years and years and years. And I was always excited to hear pastors say, please turn in your Bibles too. And then to hear the wrinkling of the pages and the snapping of the pages. And i got to be honest with you, I have been struggling all week with this message. I, I started on Monday and it just, it just didn't fit. On Tuesday, I thought I had it. Wednesday, I called or I texted Mary Fran, I'm preaching on America. And by the way, isn't the bulletin absolutely beautiful? 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Let's go ahead and read that together. It's right in front of you in your bulletin. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. What a great promise. My question to our church today, and to Christianity in general, what kind of person does it take to do the qualifying things, the four things? Humble ourselves, pray, seek His face, and turn from our wicked ways. What kind of person does it take to do that? Do you have, okay, is Diana? Uh, Spirit-filled. Spirit-filled, yes. Are you born with a certain DNA that's different from anybody, everybody else? No. No, we're all born sinners, saved by grace, through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So as I ask you to turn to the Hall of Faith chapter, I want you to... I want you to think, what made these people so different that they are mentioned? One entire chapter is set aside to remember them. The name of the message today is America. But maybe you can find a better name for the message. The whole um, purpose of the message today is to call a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy people, to walk in the faith that God has prepared for us to walk in. What will make America great? Do we need another George Washington to come on the scene? Wouldn't hurt, I'm sure, but it's not George or Ben or any of the 56 original signers of the Declaration of Independence. They were all wonderful men. And they did pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor that America might be established in liberty, knowing that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the Pursuit of happiness. I was amazed as I read the Declaration of Independence over again last week. The pursuit of happiness. And as Jesus started his first great sermon on the mount, he starts with happiness. Blessed, happy are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Happy are the meek. Happy are those who grieve. Happy are the, happy are you when you are persecuted and men revile and, and attack you. Happy are you. Blessed are you. And even in our own declaration, the pursuit of happiness, should we be seeking purity? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Should we? Should we have the heart of a grieving? 
grieve why, why are grievers blessed? Why are grievers happy? Why are the mournful happy? Because the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. No matter how dark the situation, no matter, no matter how unreachable, the Lord says, happy are you if you seek after me and seek after me early. For those who seek after me early shall find me. Are you a God chaser today? Amen. Do you chase after him? Seek after me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? And all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. Very good, David. Matthew 6, 33. But we left out a very important thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then all these things. We'll be getting back to righteousness in a minute. Chapter 11 of the Hall of Faith chapter in the book of Hebrews. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now your version may have a different wording, but it's still the same. For by it the elders obtained a good report. And I love this. I'm not going to read all these verses, but... Verse number three, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which could be seen or which did appear. And then the author of Hebrews goes into the hall of faith. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Verse number 7, by faith Noah. Verse 8, by faith Abraham. Verse 9, by faith Abraham sojourned in the land of promise as a pilgrim in a strange country. Verse 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and gave birth to Isaac. I like when we get down to verse number 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this old earth. Did you know, church, and I know it's become almost a cliche, but we're not home yet. So many people want to can or get all they can and can all they get as if this is it. Where the truth of the matter is, we can't take it with us. And for the Christian, who would want to? So I want to go back and talk about America. And why is faith so important today? Why is your faith so incredibly important? And does it really matter? Because we read the back of the book and we win. But is faith that important? Do you have the faith of an Abel today? Do you have the faith of an Enoch to walk so close with God? And the Abels are laughing on the back row. Yes, they have the faith of Abel's. The faith of Enoch, who walked so closely with God that he was not because God took him. Abraham. In the Abrahamic covenant, God said, Abraham, get up and remove yourself from your family and your kindred and even your nation and go to a land that I will show you. And by faith, Abraham packed up and left, not even knowing where he was going. Do you have that kind of faith? Do we as a nation have that kind of faith? Do you have the faith, ladies of a Sarah, who God says, I'm going to bless you beyond your wildest imaginations. Does God still do that? And if he does, do we have the faith to receive that word? By faith, David. By faith, Moses. 
by faith. What drew by faith Joseph? What made them so different, church? By faith, Ruth said, No, Mom, wherever you go, I want to go. Your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. By faith, Ruth. By faith, Deborah. By faith, Samson. By faith, Gideon. By faith, Joshua. Do you have that kind of faith? And if not, why not? And is it only those particular heroes of the faith that were just blessed with this miraculous amount of faith? Are they so different than us? I think God's people get this idea that they were so holy that they didn't even have to eat. God would just sustain them. No, they hungered and thirst just like you and I do. They got dressed, well, kind of the same way you and I do. Their robes were really big in those days. But they got dressed and they went out and they were tempted and they were tested and they were tried just like you and I are. Just like we are right now in our nation. What made them so amazing that they were recorded in this hall of faith? And by the way, could we add a couple of verses? Could we add... By faith, George. By faith, Diana. By faith, Marty and Mike and Donna. We can go all around the room. By faith, could your name be added to that? Not seeing their final destination, but taking God at His word that you will never leave us, you'll never forsake us, that you'll supply all our needs according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Do you believe that you really can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives you the strength? Do you believe that you can rejoice in the Lord always? And again I say rejoice. Do you believe that? If you do, praise the Lord. If not, why not? Do you believe and if you were in a boat with 11 other Christians, now you Navy people, you get a hankering for this more than us uh, uh, Army and, and uh, uh, fly boys and all that stuff. But if you were at sea, you're in a boat, and all of a sudden you see this image come to you, and everyone in the boat, and including yourself, you're scared to death, you're frightened, and all of a sudden, you launch out and say, Lord, is that you? And Jesus is walking on top of the water. And he said, yeah, it's me. And then you, of all the people in that boat, said, well, if it's really you, let me come out and be where you are. And Jesus says, come on. Would you jump out of the boat? Would you throw your legs over the safety and security of that boat and dip your feet on top of the water? Would you do that? Chuck says, amen, I would, because I got a really healthy life insurance policy. Definitely on the line. Definitely. No doubt about it. I gotta be honest with you, I have some doubts. If I'm being honest, I'd be a little bit nervous. Human beings are not, because of the, the laws of gravity, they cannot. there's that propensity for someone, even though I'm not completely obese, I'm working on it, I would sink like a rock. But Jesus says, come on. Today, Jesus says, come on, church. Step out and be where I'm at. Take that step of faith. Have you really decided to follow Jesus? No turning back. No turning back. Yesterday afternoon in Greeley, I looked over that congregation in that facility. I love those people at Greeley Village, and I looked at them. The youngest person, I think, is probably 84. And they're sitting there, some in wheelchairs, some in their seats, all 
white hair, gray hair, no hair. And we sing songs like, I have decided to follow Jesus. And for those who can remember, their mind goes back to their younger days when they made that commi commitment to Jesus Christ. And here they are, 60, 70 years later, 80 years later, one person's life, still faithful. What does America need today? Faith. Faith. America needs God's chosen people, the house of God, the, the ecclesia, the called out assembly of God's people to say, Lord Jesus, I want to jump out of the boat today. I want to walk by faith and not by sight. If all those Bible characters that Pastor just mentioned, from Abel to Zechariah, and all those faces and places and names in between, if they can do it, not even knowing where they're going, if Peter can jump out of the boat while the rest of the church is trying to pull him back in, Peter, what are you doing? I think I'd be one of the other 11 trying to pull Peter back in. Which one of you would be the Peter? That I'd try to, having a pastor's heart, I wouldn't want you to sink out there. Jesus has come. He says, come to me. And as you step out of that boat, Peter, keep your eyes on me. The bottom line of all of these heroes of the faith, the one common denominator is that they refused to walk by sight. They trusted, they believed and they took that one big step. For Abraham, it was a step out of the Ur of the Chaldees. For Moses, it was that step out of the backside of a desert. And on and on and on, they took that step. And God blessed them. Noah took the step of picking up a hammer and a saw. Because it was going to rain. And the people did not even know what rain was. Neither did Noah. But God said, Noah, build me a boat. These are the dimensions because it's going to rain. Okay, Lord. And he just started nailing and sawing and cutting away. And then here come the animals, two by two. Faith. Our churches need more faith. During the Nixon presidency, Johnny Cash wrote a, a, a ballad. He didn't sing it, but he did read it. And I wanted to do my best. I love this little ballad about the ragged old flag. I walked through a county courthouse square. On a park bench, an old man was sitting there. I said, sir, your courthouse looks kind of run down. He said, no, it's all right for our little town. I said, but your flagpole leans quite a bit, and there's that ragged old flag flying from it. He said, have a seat. So I sat down. He said, is this the first time you've been to our little town? I believe it is. He said, well, we don't like to brag, but we're sort of proud of that ragged old flag. You see, it got that hole in it there when Washington was crossing the Delaware. It got powder burned the night that Francis Scott Key was watching and writing, oh, say, can you see? It got kind of pulled apart in New Orleans with Packingham and Jackson tugging at her seams. She almost fell at the Alamo with the Texas flag. Ah, oh, but she waved on, though. She got cut with a sword at Chancellorsville and another cut at Shiloh Hill. 
Then there was Robert E. Lee, Beauregard, and Bragg, and oh, how the south wind blew hard on that ragged old flag. In Flanders Field, in World War I, she got that big hole in her with a Bertha gun. She turned blood red in World War II. Even hung limp and low before it was through. She went on to Korea and then Vietnam. You see, she went where she was sent by her Uncle Sam. She waved from ships on the briny foam. But now, now she's not waving here much back here at home. In this good land, she's being abused. She's defiled, dishonored, burned, refused. And the government for which she stands is scandalized now in many lands. She's wearing threadbare. She's mighty thin. But I think she's in good shape for the shape she's in. She's been through the fire before, and I know she'll take a whole lot more. So we put her up in the morning. We take her down every night. We never let her touch the ground, and we fold her up just right. On second thought, I do like to brag, because I'm mighty proud of that ragged old flag. Thank you, Johnny Cash, for reminding us the price of freedom. Thank you, author of Hebrews, for reminding us of the price of faithfulness. Faith is just seeing things as God sees them. So many things we worry about in all of our tomorrows, God just smiles at because all of our tomorrows are His yesterdays. He's already been there. He knows how it's all going to play out. So let's not be weary in well-doing. Would you jump back to chapter 12 with me? I want to read the last two verses of chapter 12. Verse number 38 of chapter, oh, I'm sorry, chapter 10, I'm sorry. Chapter 10, verse 38. Now the just, or the justified, or we know them as the saved, the born again, shall live by what church? Faith. But if any man draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. For we are not as one of them who draw back under perdition, but of them that believe, that go on to the saving of the soul. Go on, church. Go on when we're weary, but just keep going on. Go on through the darkness, but keep going on because He is our light. Going on when we can't see the end from the beginning, but God can, and so keep going on. Keep going on when you don't understand What's, what's happening all around you. But as you go on, I need to remind you to keep your eyes on Christ. Now you can turn to chapter 12. And verses 1 and 2. And you're not going to believe this, but I'm getting ready to close already. I know you're thinking, no way. But I really am. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that does so easily beset us, or those besetting sins, and let us run with patience the race that God has placed before us. And verse number two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our Faith, looking unto Him, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despised, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Him, church. Looking unto Him. 
if we can see it, it wouldn't be faith, would it? We know the story of what happened with Peter. He jumped out of the boat and he was walking on top of the water. And it's not because he knew where all the rocks were to step. He was walking on water. But then he did something that a lot of us do sometimes. We take our eyes off of Jesus and onto the circumstances. The wind was still blowing when, when Peter jumped out of the boat. The rains were still coming down. The lightning was still shining from the east to the west. It was a storm. It was frightening. But he jumped out of the boat. And in spite of the circumstances, he began to walk on the water. And it wasn't until he took his eyes off Christ and back onto the circumstances that he began to sing. What's the hope for America? It's millions of God's people who will say, I am not going to walk by sight or feelings or emotions anymore. I'm going to walk by pure faith. And I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. The beginning and ending of my faith. Will you join me in that? Will you walk with me by faith? Amen. Thank you. Amen. Wow, Mary Fran. I think the shyest gal in our whole church said amen out loud. Thank you, Mary Fran. To walk by faith. It doesn't take a certain DNA. It doesn't take being born to certain parenthood or lineage or genealogy. It doesn't matter a lick about your family tree. All that matters is Jesus, as God is your Father, Jesus is your Savior. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Walk by faith and not by sight. The world wants you to the media wants you to look around, be frightened, be very afraid. But my Bible says, I love what Paul told Timothy, I have not given you the spirit of fear, Amen. but of love, power, and of a sound 